Welcome to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Udekang. It's the show where we chat about business analysis and project management issues, the challenges and triumphs within those fields. It's inspiring, it's upbeat, it's informative, and of course, most of all, it's very much inquisitive. My guest today is a business analyst who is an editor for Medium.com's Analysts Corner. He's published three online courses with Udemy, Full Business Analysis Study Guide, Agile Business Analysis Study Guide, and most recently, Business Agility. His experience is in process management, quality management, and enterprise architecture. Please help me welcome to today's show, joining us from Melbourne, Australia, Igor Arkhipov. Welcome, Igor. What an introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, Thanks, well, Marcus. You're welcome. It's well-deserved, no doubt. Now, I, I like to start off the show by asking my guests how they got into their field. I think it's fascinating. Everyone has their own story told in their own words. So let's start off by asking you, what was your path to becoming a successful business analyst? Sure, why not? Well, successful is uh, an interesting term. I'm not sure how to define that, but I can definitely tell you a story of how I landed where I am. So uh, it all started uh, when I was probably my second year in the uni. And it was about the time when you know young people, they decide to start um, earning some income of their own and get some independence. And because by the time uh, my courses were all about economics and programming, I was like, well, I probably need to choose something from those two. And I went with programming just because economics was a bit too, in, in a too hard basket for me at the time. Um, and that's how I started to look for a first, first job. And I didn't start as a business analyst straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a bit of a pass to get into this profession. And honestly, I guess from what I see on the market, a lot of um, more successful, uh, more efficient bees, they actually have um, one or two different uh, job titles before switching into the profession. And, and I guess the reason for that is um, it's, it's really hard to be an effective BA if you don't have that um, background knowledge or context knowledge of the business and how things are, um, are going there. Because um, otherwise, look, if your key skill is, you know, documenting requirements, managing requirements, without the ability to provide advice on how to better understand the problem, how to design a solution, how to deliver a solution, it is merely a position of a scribe rather than a full, you know, um, yeah. business analyst. And so I, th I think that helps. Not that, you know, it is a must to have another job before you jump into the VA, but I think that's a part that I've seen quite, um, quite a lot. So coming back to, to, my, to my journey. Um, so um, I realized, yeah, well, I, want to, I want to try this, you know, uh, working thing. Um, so I put um, an, um, an, um, an advertising, not advertising, like my, my small CV on, on a forum for, you know, students who look for job. And then I got contacted by a guy uh, through ICQ, if you remember, it was a popular oh, messenger yeah, yeah. somewhat, you know, many years ago. Um, and we agreed to meet at, at their office. So I went there having no idea what to expect. And that was probably one of the most interesting experiences of getting a job in my life. Because when I, when I uh, went there, um, there was a door and then a stairway going into the basement. So you go down, it becomes quite dark and a long corridor in front of you. So I go down that corridor, it's dark and quiet. And I'm like, where did, where did I get myself into? Um, so you, you go to the end of that corridor and then you need to make kind of a U-turn and walk back alongside the same wall, but on the other side, again, along that corridor. And the first thing you see um, was a huge uh, painting of an Indian chief in a war outfit with an altar in front of him uh, with candles that were lit. And there were like tambourines all over the place and some other, you know, mystic masks and things. And I'm like, oh, is it, is it a legit job or is it a cult of a sort? <laughs> I was not sure, um, but I, I kept, kept walking because well, I, I got there anyway. Uh, and the first thing I saw was a kitchen. And in the kitchen, there were two software developers uh, playing, um, what was that? Uh, I think it was a PlayStation or something very loudly and emotionally. And then there was a guy who looked like a hippie with long hair who rocked into that room and shouted at them, guys, go back to work, stop doing what you're doing. And they told him to bugger off. So he went away and um, he rushed to the power, um, how do you call it? Like power control thingy and switched off the power uh, for the whole room so that they had to go back to work. And that guy with long hair turned out to be the chief operating officer of the business. And he was my manager to be for 
uh, quite a few years. It was an amazing place to work for, uh, as you can imagine. Um, they, they, they did some, you know, internet things, banners. Uh, the, the key product, product was a banner exchange system. So a platform to show advertising based on targeting and things on different platforms. Um, but yeah, it was a nice place to start. I definitely learned a lot. Uh, I definitely had a lot of um, fun working there. Uh, and I started there as a, so, um, as a software tester with the aim to learn the platform as I'm helping them with testing to then transition into a software developer. And after spending about a year doing that thing, I um, realized I'm actually quite a bad software developer. Um, not that I cannot produce code, I can, but I'm not very happy with the quality. And when it comes to uh, you know, solving challenging development problems, I'm like, well, I'm not that, that good at it. And I couldn't see myself um, becoming better in it all the time. It was just you know, not, not my, my, my thing. But then coincidentally, at the same time, our analyst at the time, he left the business. And my manager, he probably saw a potential or maybe, I don't know, in some of our conversations, I explained what I was studying at the university, which was about you know, business process management and some a bit of PM, a bit of BA things. And he was like, hey, do you want to try? And sure enough, I said, yes. Uh, and, and that was a really great change for my career because once I start doing, started doing that, that is when I realized, hey, that's a thing that I could do. Uh, I can talk to people. I can understand what they want. And having this understanding of how the development side of things works, I can actually convert it into something useful to help build things that uh, people ask for. And so it all started from there. Um, I've spent, I think, two years being an analyst with them. Then I moved on to another place and another place and finally uh, ended here at Eyes of War Australia. Uh, now I'm heading the business analysis team here uh, nationally. So I think that was quite, quite, quite a journey starting from that really small, tiny, um, and a bit weird place, and yeah, going here into a big consulting gig. Um, Igor, that, so that's, that's my that's journey. A, yeah, that's a fast. That's a fascinating story. I'm listening to it. I'm thinking as you describe it. I'm thinking this is a movie going through this dark <laughs> hallway. You know. Anyway, fascinating stuff. Yeah. So I'm, I I know you've you've used a lot of business modeling tools, uh, in Bizagi, uh, Visual Paradigm, MS Visio, Eris. Oh, I've I've used Eris. I've used uh, MS Visio. I fooled around with Bizagi a bit. But um, when you look at these tools, what, what's your favorite business modeling tool and why? Uh, that's a good question. Look, uh, I've been thinking about it uh, some time ago, just generally reflecting on uh, tool sets that we use as business analysts. And uh, what I realized is tools are actually secondary to, uh, I guess, the output that you want to get out of them and effectively the value that you want to get out of them. And uh, one of the things I realized, especially recently working at Isobar, because we are uh, more of a consulting agency, it's not like we are you know, doing some uh, in-house stuff for years and years. We need to jump in, sort a problem, um, give a solution, go away. And what I realized is um, using tools that require business to hire a certified professional to just understand how to work with them and then train the rest of the business to understand what the outputs look like and how to read them is probably not the most efficient solution in many yeah. cases. So uh, nowadays I'm looking at it more from a point of view of what is the message that I'm trying to deliver mm -hmm. um, then what is the medium that works best for that message and finally okay which tool can I use uh, to produce that medium. And most likely it results in using things like, you know, more, more casual things um, and more easier to pick up things uh, rather than a professional specialized software. Mm -hmm. That said, there is still a use case for, for having those. It's just, um, I guess from my experience, uh, I tend not to use them when I can, because when you introduce a really, you know, complicated specialized tool, there's a lot of overhead mm -hmm. that uh, not always is justified. So, for example, most recently, uh, I fell in love with a tool called Miro, um, formerly known as Real-Time Board. Um, that's an online collaboration tool. And what I like about it is it helps you combine the structured approach to diagramming with the ease of use and uh, the intuitive interface of uh, you know, being in a physical room, working with a physical wall with sticky notes and uh, you know, just, just marker on the board. Um, and the most, I guess, important part of it is that it um, fosters collaboration. Mm, so yeah. how we use it is we prepare a canvas with some pre-populated you know, questions, pictures, arrows, things uh, for a workshop. We jump on the workshop and because these days everything is remote, it is a remote workshop, um, people 
open it in their computers and we can collaborate real time. And it literally takes up to five minutes to pick it up and start being productive with the tool. So um, from my point of view, that overweights um, all the benefits of having a specialized tool uh, just because we can so easily pick it up, adopt it and start getting value out of it. Um, mm -hmm. In many cases, um, yeah. I'm not saying that it is a solution for all the problems, but I think for majority of like discovery work, collaboration work, stakeholder engagement work, a tool like that is probably more beneficial than a specialist tool. Yeah, no, I think I, I like that collaboration aspect of Miro too. I'm quite a big fan of it. It's like post-it notes, but everyone uses them at the same time. <laughs> kind of yeah, thing. yeah, yeah it's, it's kind so of cool. good, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's really cool. And it, it works really well online in the, the Zoom environment too, right? Um, yeah. you've, you've, uh, you've, you've used a bunch of prototyping tools, right? Balsamic or balsamic mockups, I guess, Gliffy. Uh, what's, what's your favorite uh, prototyping tool? <laughs> um, if I'm being honest, my favorite prototyping tool is having a UX person on the project that works the best every time. Um, but if we don't have one, uh, then I think it's very similar to my previous answer. Um, depending on what is the prototype that you're trying to produce and what is the hypothesis, hypothesis hard word, uh, for Monday morning, uh, it's not Monday, it's Saturday, Sunday, Sunday morning. Okay. I, I need my coffee, I haven't had a coffee in the morning. Anyway, um, to test your hypothesis, um, different types of prototyping can be used, right? When it is a visual prototype, uh, like mocks of some interfaces, wireframes, most of these tools that are specialized in doing like just that, they're so similar that it's really mm -hmm. hard to distinguish. Yeah. Like, I mean, I can pick up uh, Balsamic, I can pick up Gliffy, I can pick up uh, a mirror add-on for wireframing, I can pick up uh, Visio with some uh, wireframing um, stencils, is it called, like icons. Um, so it doesn't really matter because mm -hmm. end of the day, they do the same thing. They yeah. have a collection of pre-created visuals that represent elements of the interface. So you can, you know, just put them together, produce something that looks like a product, not really, but good enough to collect some feedback. And then you show it to people, you get, get that feedback. Um, if you don't have access to that, uh, you can do the same with, you know, a pen and pencil and paper yeah. uh, and just put in front of people. I think it's pretty much the same um, level of fidelity anyway. The only problem a benefit of having a tool to doing that is when you can make it clickable. But mm -hmm. if you want your prototype to be clickable, then you probably want to use a more complicated tool that actually allows to do it like Envision or Figma or something like that. So it is a bit more high fidelity and a bit more, you know, having the full feel of the final product if you want it to make it to be, yeah. to be clickable. Nice, nice stuff. Okay, so a lot of business analysts, we use Jira or Confluence or both. <laughs> uh, I've used both. Uh, I started using Jira like about five, six years ago. Uh, when it was just like a ticketing tool long before it started mm -hmm. to be the, you know, the big tool that it is today. So how do you, I mean, how well versed are you, first of all, or how well versed should business analysts be with Jira and Confluence? I mean, how crucial is this software in the workplace, do you think? Mm -hmm. um, look, uh, I've been using those tools for, uh, I don't know, years, maybe 10 years, starting from my very first place that I described to you. Um, and it was like a really old version where all you could do is you know, just log your tickets and that's it. Yeah. Uh, and then they introduced all these fancy boards and automate workflow automation and things. Um, I think Jira and Confluence, they're good tools. Um, that said, some of their UI, UX decisions are questionable. That's mm -hmm. the feedback that I get from a lot of users. Like it, it's very powerful, but it takes time to get used to just their way of doing things, uh, which is probably fair enough about all tools. Um, just answering your question, how important it is to know these two tools for a business analyst. Um, I think it is important to understand the systems that they, the types of systems that they represent. So any business analyst, regardless of um, their industry or the type of projects they do, they will have to deal with some sort of uh, task tracking system uh, and some sort of knowledge retention system. So uh, Jira and Confluence are probably one of the most popular on the market, and there are reasons for that. They're pretty good at what they're doing. That said, they're not the only ones. You could as yeah. well use Azure DevOps as a replacement or some mm -hmm. other things. Um, and what is good about it is uh, behind the scenes, the theory of these tools, they're very similar. Like the ticketing tool, you, you, you need to understand how to structure your tickets in a way that it is easy to pick up by the development team or delivery team whether it is development or not, um, how to report uh, from them, how to 
um, slice it down in the chunks that are easier to estimate, to prioritize, um, to, uh, to manage. And the same with knowledge management too. We need to understand or have an approach to how you structure the knowledge so it is uh, easier to pick up by someone who hasn't been a part of the journey. So it can live on uh, way after you finish your uh, part of the project or the development part of the project. Um, so from that point of view, I think it's a must for every business analyst to have these two skills. Um, which tool it manifests itself in, it, it's really you know, depending on the industry that people work in and I guess the types of companies they work with. So um, some industries, some countries, some companies, they may have their preference uh, tool set that they usually work with. Um, whether it is zero confluence or not, doesn't really matter as long as you know, you know this, this, this theory and you can apply it to a system. It doesn't take a lot of time to pick up a specific system as long as you're familiar with how this class of systems work. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like that answer. It's definitely understand the system first and then use the software to do the job that you need to get done. Cool. Yeah. Uh, requirements modeling notations. You know, there's there's uh, there's a bunch of them out there. You know, process and requirements modeling notations. We've got business process modeling notation (BPMN). We've got UML, ER models, use cases, use stories, a whole bunch of them. Which one do you find the most effective? Um, I think it's very similar to my answer to the diagram and tools. The ones that are easier to pick up without the need to invest into mm -hmm. learning uh, too much. Um, because the whole point of requirements uh, modeling is to make sure that your requirements are understood by stakeholders. And depending on who your stakeholders are, you can pick up the, the uh, tools or the techniques that work better for them. Mm -hmm. From my experience, um, I think, well, I used to do a lot of UML uh, somewhat like 10 years ago when it was a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as popular nowadays, but I still use elements of UML at times, especially um, I think it's called the sequence diagram when mm. you've got uh, your messages between the actors, because um, anytime you build an IT solution and there's any integration aspect to it, you need to have a tool that will um, describe that integration. And I find the sequence diagrams to work the best to do that. Yeah. Um, I also find myself creating quite a lot of process uh, diagrams. However, um, um, I think what I'm using is a very simplified version of BPMN. So BPMN, I think it's, it's a good notation. So it's a great notation, but it is also an overcomplicated notation. Because yes, yeah. if you look at it, there are like 100 plus different signs and icons that represent different things, which makes sense if you use it for um, process automation tools. So when you want your uh, diagram to become an executable piece of software, but if it's if it is not in an environment like that, and you just want to communicate to someone, this is how your process flow works. All you need is swim lanes, uh, actions, yeah. events, and maybe decisions. Um, and then just following some good practices in how to make your diagram uh, easy, easy to read. You know, just make sure your alignment is right, make sure it's evolved in one direction, those little things that help with comprehension. And, and you're good, like you, you mm -hmm. can put it together, you can send it to um, all the people, most of the people will pick it up naturally. Uh, those who have troubles, they'll ask you one or two questions and they'll get it. Um, mm. and, and I take it from there. Um, nice. One other tool that I'm using a lot is user story mapping. So user stories have become my go-to for documenting the um, like written requirements, the documented requirements. Yeah. Um, and, and it works like amazingly well for me. Cool. Yeah, I find that too. Like BPMN is nice. Like you said, it's kind of overcomplicated. I take a couple of symbols from it. I use those and that, you know, I, I get on with my day. Uh, UML, I used to use that years ago. Like you said, it's not as popular now. Um, the ten focus tends to be on more user stories, but you're right. It's, it depends on the situation, depends on, on you know, how quickly or how, you know, what, the, what the client needs type of thing. Now, in, in, in the case of, of medium.com, you know, that's how I met you. Uh, you're an editor at medium.com's Analyst Corner. So I have a few articles that I've thrown up there and you've edited them for me. What, uh, what type of experience has that been as an editor? Uh, I mean, editing those multitudes of articles on a daily basis. How do you, what, what, um, what's your takeaway from that or your experience from that? Mm. Uh, good question. I think it was a very illuminating experience, to be honest. Um, I started it as, as an experiment. So um, about a year, year and a half ago, I was at a conference, uh, Business Analysis Professional Day in Australia. And I spoke to a guy there uh, who was presenting, I don't remember what was the topic, and we had a chat. And then we talked about the reflection as a part of, um, you know, just 
not, not just business analysis, but generally becoming a professional. So um, this, this ability to reflect on what happened to you and use that uh, reflection to become a better version of you. And as a part of the conversation, we spoke about writing down your thoughts and writing down your experiences. Um, and then we discussed, you know, like blogs and articles and things. And I was like, hey, I should probably start a blog. Um, I did it some time ago, uh, and then I was just too lazy to continue. And I was like, hey, maybe, maybe it's you know another another call to give us another go. So I started writing things down. I created a small, tiny, ugly website. Um, used one of those platforms, you know, do-it-yourself website. Um, put together a couple of articles there, and then uh, realized that there are platforms that do it better. Uh, including Medium. So I was like, hey, why am I bothering with all that stuff? Why don't I just, you know, create an account and start writing it there? Because it's easier and it's much um, better looking. So I moved my articles into there and I started writing some, some stuff there. Um, and then uh, just exploring the platform, I realized that they have this concept of publications, which is like a, a collective blog, I guess, where mm -hmm. multiple authors can contribute to the common topic and it is all published in one kind of web journal. Mm. So I thought, hmm, there must be something on business analysis here. And when I started to, to, to uh, go through the publications, first of all, I realized it's hard to find publications in Medium. Like, um, I don't know, their, their search is a bit, bit um, ridiculous. But anyway, I couldn't find anything that would be really focused on what I was interested in. So I thought, well, let me give it a go, let, let me start it. So I created it and I was a uh, corner, a publication, put my things in there. Uh, then just speaking to some of my uh, friends, colleagues, I uh, got a few more people to contribute. And all of a sudden, quite a lot of people uh, responded. And um, I started getting just requests from random strangers who came across it. They read that article, you know, right with us, uh, contacted me and I'm like, hey, this is becoming a theme, that's, that's cool. Um, and uh, look, I, I think it's been really great experience of, of learning for me because just reading all these things, reading all the experiences that people have in their environments, in their countries, because we've got um, writers from all over the world um, it's been, yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, I think I, I'm enjoying doing it. I also got help from one of my colleagues, Rob, who is actually the, the actual editor who helps with editing things. Um, and I'm probably there just, you know, um, more from a conceptual side of things. Like if this topic, not, not good enough, but if it is aligned with what we uh, want to do or not, and then Rob's come in to help with language and things. Um, and mm. then we, we publish uh, the articles. And look, um, it's not like the biggest publication on Medium. Uh, I think we have maybe 300 daily visitors. Um, it's not a lot compared to like thousands and thousands that the biggest ones have, like the startup and the others. But I think it's a decent amount of people who are interested in the topics of organizational analysis, business analysis, quality, enterprise architecture. So I think it is, um, yeah, I, th I think it serves its purpose. And I'm really and I'm really happy with where it is now. Nice, yeah. nice, yeah. And like you said, there's people all over the world who contribute. And talking about all over the world, uh, you worked in Russia at one time for a number of years. Yeah. How does the Russian marketplace sort of differ for BAs compared to say like an Australian environment? Hmm. Look, that's a, that's a hard question to answer for me, to be honest. Um, I, I was born in Russia, so I moved to Australia about six years ago. Um, so my first work experience was there, but that said, um, I guess I was lucky in a sense that I worked in a very specific industry, which is IT, and most of the places were not just any IT, but mm -hmm. e-commerce side of IT, which is kind of uh, the bleeding edge of, um, you know, work, work environment, the work culture, uh, the technology that they use, the uh, management methods that they use, um, especially in Russia. So if I compare like the, the IT uh, business in Russia to similar types of um, businesses that have been exposed to in Australia, for example, I would say it's very similar, like the types of challenges, the types of approaches, um, the general uh, the general work, work environment the culture in the business it's, it's it's more or less the same like there are cultural differences of course but they don't come so much from the industry maybe a little bit from the the um you know the country itself so for example um 
no, let me come back to that example in a second. Um, ju just uh, to, to, uh, talking about the, uh, the different industries. That said, um, if you happen to be in Russia and work not in like e-commerce, IT, web um, industry, but in one of the more traditional uh, industries, I think that there will be a huge gap in what is expected of you and how uh, the business is managed. So what I witnessed in Russia is that a lot of traditional businesses, they're very, very old school and traditional in the way they're managed. So especially the management practices, uh, I think they are like somewhere from mid last century and they haven't evolved much uh, compared to, you know, some of these more startup -y, hipster kind of companies where the management practices are up to date with the technology that they're using. Yeah. So uh, I think that's one of the things that would be different because, for example, in Australia, I've, what, what I've seen is the management practices are much more aligned and up to date with the uh, technology practices that are used mm -hmm. and with the, um, I guess, tools and just approach to uh, defining, you know, goals, business experiences um, that the company applies. So in Russia, there's a huge gap between industries in, with, with that regard. That's, that's fascinating. Uh, uh, coming back, yeah, to the interesting examples, um, I just remember working for Kaspersky Lab for a couple of years. Uh, that's a cybersecurity company. They have their headquarters in Russia, but they are, they are a multinational uh, organization. Um, I think they've got local offices like on, on all the continents. And uh, they've got users on all the continents, um, inclu including the Antarctic. Uh, so that's, that's quite, quite a big business. Um, so uh, when I was employed with them, uh, I was a part of the um, uh, customer support departments looking after the quality control and specifically the business processes. And as a part of the job, um, I had to compare different KPIs from different parts of the world. And um, one of the things that uh, surprised me at the time was um, with regards to the phone calls. So you know how you call the call center and they need to pick up the phone and there are some KPIs behind the scenes of how long they are allowed to spend on a call for a particular type of request. Right. Um, we realized that some countries, uh, the average time on the phone is like two, three times longer compared to some other countries. And we're like, mm -hmm. something's not right there. Our KPIs definitely don't work there. So let's, let's dig deeper and see what is going on there. And we realized that it was a really cultural thing mm -hmm. in, um, a collection of countries, it was not considered to be polite for, a, uh, for an agent on the phone to ask what was the problem before having a conversation about, you know, recent things, uh, things like, you know, weather and football scores and yeah, politics yeah. and some other things. Yeah. Um, and we had to adjust those KPIs because, well, we could not force the people to, you know, start being impolite to yeah. our customers. Yeah. Um, so th th that was, um, wow. yeah, I think it was hilarious, but also it was a good learning experience uh, to go through that. That's fascinating. Now you've got three courses on Udemy, right? And most recently yep. uh, you put up Business Agility. Tell us a bit about, about the courses and also, I mean, maybe how, how you went about getting your courses on Udemy mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah, that, that, that all was a bit random, to be honest. Um, back in the uni, I really wanted to uh, consider a career in education, you know, just to stay as a part of university, maybe, maybe get a PhD, maybe, you know, some other uh, academic stuff. Um, I almost got there, uh, but then a few, a few things happened on the university side and uh, my, um, I guess my um, PhD scholarship got um, delayed by about a year and I couldn't start with, with, the, uh, with the department. Well, it's called department faculty with the faculty at the time. Um, so it all got delayed. And then I, you know, got to my new job and I was like, ah, oh, do I want to go back to academia again? Because, you know, um, this thing pays a lot and academia doesn't. And uh, I started a family and I was like, nah, it's probably, you know, lower on my priority lists. So I actually never um, did the PhD that I wanted. Um, which, well, it's okay, I guess. Uh, but another thing I never actually um gotten myself to educate in others and that is something that i really like doing just i find i guess personal pleasure in explaining things to people so that they can understand those things and start applying them and become better in what they're doing um, as a part of my master's degree i also did a bit of teaching for bachelor students and it was a really great experience which i really liked and uh, for years i thought about it and i was like is there a way for me to to do that without getting myself into the heavy like academic machine of a big you know higher education uh, industry and one day it just occurred to me that 
hey, there are all these online things like, like Udemy. Uh, and uh, I've just taken a course there on uh, Lean Six Sigma, which I really liked. And um, as a part of exploring the platform, I found a little button, become a teacher. So I clicked on it and I read the uh, instructions and I was like, I can do it. It does sound that hard. Um, I was wrong, it was quite hard, um, but um, still doable. So I thought, okay, what can I teach? And being a business analyst by trade, well, that's, that was a pretty obvious choice. So I decided to take the behavior guide as my guiding, um, I guess, agenda and put a training around it to help people prepare for a professional certification uh, that is aligned with the behavior guide. So that's the uh, CBAP or CCBA. Um, and I put it all together. I started preparing some uh, learning materials, some slides, um, some exercises. And then coincidentally, my family went on a vacation for a couple of weeks and I had to stay because I didn't have enough uh, leave days at work. And I was like, that's a good opportunity to record something because it's quiet um, and I don't have kids. So I could use the room. I moved all the furniture. I had a you know nice corner where I could record things. It was still pretty bad quality, to be honest, uh, like sound and video. I mean, it was okay, but I'm not very happy with, with the results. But then I think it was uh, pretty good content based on the feedback. So people are still applying for that course and they still uh, rate it quite highly, which, which, which uh, you know, which is probably good. Um, so I did that, I launched it, um, I listened to some feedback. Turns out it's, it's um, probably, people find it useful. So I was like, hey, I probably need to do something more. Um, and that is how I started to look at more of a, a, an agile analysis because, well, I guess agile is a big thing anyway. Uh, people need to know how to do it. And there, were, there was this um, agile certification by IABA that becomes uh, more and more trending now. So I was like, let me put another course to help people prepare for that thing. Um, so I did that, launched it, a um, bit better quality. I got myself a better camera, better mic. Um, so I'm more happy with, with, with that one, to be honest. Um, and then most recently, um, I put another one that talks about business agility more in general, maybe less so focused on business analysts um, alone, but rather on the whole range of professionals. What does it mean to uh, be a part of an agile business? What does it mean to build an agile business? What to consider? How to scale from one team to a bigger enterprise? And what are the uh, challenges of uh, making that move? So these are the things that that course uh, tries tries to answer, or at least tries to um, find uh, or uncover areas that people need to consider and then deep um, go, go deeper into them uh, if they want to go into into that journey. Nice, I like that idea. You you know you want to be going to academics, and in, the, in a kind of a sense, you you did. You know you're still teaching, but just in a <laughs> yeah. different platform. That's great. So if anyone out there wants to get in touch with Igor, how can they do so? Uh, I think my LinkedIn is the best place to start. I always accept all the connection requests and I answer to people sending me messages. So that's the best way, I guess. Fantastic, great. Well, thanks very much. It's absolutely fascinating, very informative, and a lot that you can glean or the audience can glean from you. So thanks for, for coming by. Absolutely great having you. Uh, thanks, Marcus, it was a pleasure. Well, you're very welcome. All right, have yourself a great day. You too, thank you. Okay. Bye.